Hello, everybody. Before we jump into today's episode, we have two sponsors we want to say thank you to for supporting this show. The first one is Routine. You guys have heard me talk about Routine, honestly, back from the early days of the podcast, and it's still a product I use every single morning. They have a prompt for me here. I'm going to do a little impromptu on this ad read today because, honestly, this is a product that I truly believe in, and so I'm, going to, I'm just going to tell you guys exactly what I think and why. First and foremost, um, this is a stat that they shared, but when you sleep, you lose between a pound and a pound and a half of water, and most of that's just sweating while you sleep. Um, I used to not know if that was actually true, to be honest. I felt like a pound to a pound and a half of water seemed like quite a bit while I slept. But the one thing I did constantly pay attention to when I started using routine was just the fact that before using routine, I always felt a little dehydrated in the morning. And, and I'm one of those people that when I get up, I get up really early usually. I work out. One of, the, one of the first things I do is some form of fitness. It's just like what I do before everyone's awake. And so it's very easy for me to grab a coffee, you know, pre-workout, an energy drink, something with caffeine in it, and just go. When I am good about using routine first, I basically take, they come in these little single serve packets. Um, they contain half an organic lemon, a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar, Himalayan sea salt, all six essential electrolytes, and they have no sugar in them at all. A lot of hydration products are going to have sugar. So one of the things routine one of the things about routine that I love is that there's no sugar in there. Um, so when I am good about doing this consistently, I will take one of those single serve packets, I'll throw it in my mixer bottle. And whether I also put in a pre-workout or something with caffeine, or I just drink that separately, I try to drink that first. And the days I do that, I do genuinely feel hydrated and just have a different form of clarity all morning. A lot of people have tried to make their own homemade versions of routine, right? You see people making, they take an, a, a shot of the apple cider vinegar and they put a little sea salt, a little lemon in a drink. This is essentially that, but in a product that you can take with you on the go, have it ready for you first thing in the morning. I know me personally, when I'm groggy rolling out of bed, the last thing I want to do is, you know, squeeze a lemon, cut lemons up, go get the apple cider vinegar, find my sea salt. I just rip this packet open, throw it in my water, drink it, and it's good to go. You can try yours today. If you haven't tried it yet and you've been listening to this podcast for years, just try the damn routine. Give it a shot. You can use code ShaneWhite30 and get 30% off your first order. So you get 30% off by using code ShaneWhite30 and go to yourroutine.com. To make it even easier, I've added the link to yourroutine.com in the show notes. So just click on the show notes for this episode. Click on the link to yourroutine.com and don't forget to use code ShaneWhite30. All right, guys, today's episode is also bought to you by, bought to you, it's brought to you by NeuroRoast. Again, I'm going to go a little off script here. NeuroRoast is a product that I also came across during this year of 2023. They are a, a coffee brand, coffee company that's helping you optimize your brain function and overall well-being. This is another product that, to be honest with you, when I first started working with it, I was a little on the fence. I was like, do I really want to have mushrooms in my coffee? Well, folks, I will tell you when I use NeuroRoast, one of the things that has stood out to me the most is in, well, I'll back up. People that know me know that I have way too much caffeine, typically. One of the things this year I've done a good job of is cutting out alcohol. Not completely, but predominantly, I don't touch a lot of alcohol anymore. What I think I've actually done the other way, though, is add a lot more caffeine. So I do, I do definitely drink too much caffeine. That's something I need to work on next year is to try to minimize how much of that, but NeuroRoast is something that has actually helped me. Because of the way they've formulated their coffee, like unlike regular coffee, which is you know still something I consume, but NeuroRoast specifically um, doesn't cause jitters or crashes. Mushroom coffee provides a more balanced and sustained energy, allowing you to stay focused and productive throughout the day. So the times I do use NeuroRoast, I'll be honest, I, I just don't feel that jittery, like Ugh, I'm jumping out of my chair or standing here at my desk, jumping around feeling. So give NeuroRoast a try. They have some really good flavors. I'll be honest too, the two guys that started NeuroRoast are just really good, really good dudes based out of New York and uh, they're hustling and, and hopefully they can, they can get some people to try NeuroRoast this holiday season um, by listening to this podcast. So for you folks who've been on the fence, I'm telling you, it tastes delicious. They've done a fantastic job of making this coffee not only be functional, but taste fantastic. And if you want to try NeuroRoast, you can use code Shane White. So it's super simple. Just Shane White at checkout. Um, 
you'll also get 30% off. So if you go to neurorose.com, and once again, I have added that to the show notes. So just click into the show notes while you're listening to this episode, you can click on neurorose link directly. Don't forget to use code just Shane white, and you'll get 30% off your order. Um, hope you guys love both these products. I'm trying to not only bring you guys products that I use, but that I believe in on the podcast. Uh, I'm not taking ad reads for any brands that I don't really believe in. So anyway, hope you guys love both those products, yourroutine.com and neurorose.com. I've added those links to the show notes. I uh, hope you guys love it. And I got an awesome guest coming up right after this. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Shane White Show. I am pumped today to have Alex and Steve Michelson from Leisure Hydration on the podcast. Fellas, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having well. us. Pumped to have you guys on. Um, we will dive into all things leisure, but before we jump in, for everyone who's listening who either doesn't know what leisure is, has never seen the brand. Can you guys give a little background to what leisure hydration is, as well as uh, just a little bit of an intro into both of you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us on. I think from a, from a high level, leisure is a fun, approachable, super laid back hydration brand. Um, our core products are better for you, sustainable hydration drink with benefits for the mind and body. So each can has double the electrolytes of a Gatorade from a natural source, 10 vitamins and nutrients, nothing artificial. And then we added ingredients that help combat stress, support mood, like magnesium, ashwagandha, L-theanine, and B vitamins. So from a high level, that's really what we're all about. We're going after the enhanced water category. So we really see ourselves as a Gen Z vitamin water from a brand and a product benefit standpoint. But I'll let Steve hop into to his background and kind of the genesis of uh, the brand. Yeah, cool. Thanks, Alex. Well, if you can't tell, we're brothers. Uh, I'm the older brother. Alex is the smarter and younger brother. Um, so we basically grew up in Southern California. We played every sport that you can play in Southern California. Um, we both ended up uh, competing in college. So I went to out to North Carolina on a track scholarship. And by track, I mean field. I was not a runner. I was a discus and shot thrower. So I went out to Wake Forest, did that for four years, uh, had my glory and some injuries, and then moved on to being a regular person. So I worked at Nike for seven years working in marketing. Funny enough, I worked in running at Nike. So I led the digital brand marketing for Nike North America for about five years, uh, and then moved down to LA in, I think it was January 2021, um, and worked on community marketing down in LA. Um, but pretty much my whole life was around sports until uh you know working in sports um but on the marketing yeah. side i didn't know i didn't know you went to wake forest that's pretty sweet i did that's yeah. really cool i did not know that yeah i went to wake forest uh north carolina was great for four years but i don't think i need to move back there uh, at least not winston-salem maybe charlotte or um well, yeah that had to have been kind of a culture right. shock going from southern california to yeah. to north carolina right yeah i went from the beach to you know the the middle of North Carolina is very different, but it was cool. I mean, I, I have now, now I have friends all across the country. Um, all three of my best friends live in Boston. So it's, it's fun. Pretty much every time I'm in a, a big city, I can hit someone up and be like, Hey, like I'm in town. It's going to there. But, um, yeah, right. Right. And then Steve, Alex, how far apart are you guys years wise? We're five, About five years, years, roughly five years. Okay. Okay. And then, so Alex, so Steve's over at Wake Forest throwing discus and then going to Nike. Then what was your background? Yeah, so uh, I'm the younger brother. Um, I grew up playing every sport just like Steve and went from Southern California playing football. I also did track and field in high school, but uh, also the field, not a runner. Um, and I went to UCLA and played on the football team there. Um, nice. From there, when I was graduating from college, I took a role at a sales brokerage company. So we helped sell direct to consumer products from uh, DTC brands selling them into Target and Walmart. Um, and I got brought in during my senior year in college to help create a TikTok marketing agency. 
So the thought was if we could help promote brands and products on TikTok, that it would become easier to sell them into mass retail, as well as creating velocity off of the shelf. So as a 20, 22 year old with a couple months left in college, I started doing business development. We signed a couple uh, big, big clients. And by the time I walked across the stage, I was promoted to run the agency. It was a little bit crazy. So Got thrown crazy. into the fire when I was 22. <laughs> so crazy. Um, and within nine months, we hired 20 employees. We're doing a couple million in run rate as an agency and learned a ton about what to do and what not to do when hiring and firing and managing people. And that really set me up well um, from there. In April 2022, quit that job and we launched Leisure in May of 2022. Very cool. And for you guys, I mean, going all the way back to the beginning, um, was this something that you guys came up with pretty quickly and executed on? Was this something that you guys had been talking about for a long time? Or was this just kind of like an impulse? Like, hey, I'm over here doing the TikTok thing. Steve's over here at Nike. Like, I think together we could, you know, there's synergies here and we could launch our own brand. I'm so curious because it seems like and we've talked about this offline before, but like both of you, it wasn't like either of you were, were struggling. Like you both were crushing it in your early careers. And then, and then you were like, you've left both at the same time to do this. Alex, you want to take this? I can, I can also take it. Yeah, I mean, it definitely, it wasn't a super quick process to get this launched. Uh, it all started in the pandemic. So we hadn't lived together in a decade, obviously with the five-year gap between us and him going to college and then moving to Portland for, for work at Nike. But when the pandemic hit, we all figured we'd move home for what we thought would be a couple of weeks, turned into a couple of months. And I think it was a little bit of boredom, but caused us to reflect kind of on our past lives as athletes. And the one thing we kept going back to was as athletes, it's ingrained in your mind to hydrate for physical performance, whether that's lifting weights, hitting another rep, making sure you don't cramp up on the field. It was something that we always focused on and there were brands and products specifically curated for us. So you think Gatorade and Powerade and then eventually Body Armor. We were drinking those all day long as athletes. But what we had realized during the pandemic is we had both become what we call NARPs, non-athletic regular people. And we were just noticing on a day-to-day -day basis, we were more commonly dehydrated as regular people than we were athletes which we thought was interesting, but it was also something in offices uh, with Steve at Nike and on photo shoots and just from day-to-day -day life is that everyone was complaining of dehydration, but they weren't getting a cramp at their desk. So we saw a disconnect mm -hmm. between both the brand identity of sports drinks promoting athletic prowess and competition, but also benefits that were only for your body. When people mm. are really getting headaches and fatigue while you're you know, working professional or on a day-to-day basis, so that's when we kind of got to work on this was, can we create a, a product that functionally is for the mind and body and really representing the everyday working person, Gen Z millennial. Um, but I'll let Steve kind of dive into his background at Nike and how that led into our, our brand positioning and kind of the marketing there. Yeah. I mean, a couple other things too, just to add some color and some, some levity to the, the idea. Cause that's kind of my role on the team is the humor. Um, but essentially we had this realization both amongst ourselves and amongst our peers that the days that we were the worst versions of ourselves, both like how we performed creatively and professionally and how we interacted with our peers were the days that we were always the most dehydrated. So three cups of coffee, no water, or didn't drink any water at all and didn't sleep or you're hungover and you show up to work or just generally days you weren't drinking uh, any sort of liquids. Those are the days that you're the worst versions of yourselves. And we thought that was interesting that literally the only conversation around electrolytes historically have been about sports with the Gatorade and derivatives and, um, you know, rehydration with the Pedialyte derivatives. Um, I think just an, another piece too, is I was an athlete. Like I mentioned before, I had hip surgery in 2020 mm. and I was like, Alex, I'm having hip oh, wow. surgery. I'm going to be on short-term disability. I got like four or five weeks. If we're going to do this, let's, let's pull some things together in the next five weeks before I have to go back to work. Uh, so we did, and, and you know, he, I joked that he convinced me while we were on pain meds uh, to do this. Oh but, yeah, I was gonna say. Well, and yeah. also like that's you don't hear a lot of people who are uh, who are like laid up trying to recover, being like, well, let's launch a brand. Yeah, yeah. No, I love but that. it was it was a little bit of both. I mean, that definitely was like, hey, I'm I'm a little bit bored, and you know, I was a type I'm a type A person. You know, went to college on a scholarship, worked at Nike, um, so I, I needed like some sort of mental stimulation. 
Um, but I think the really interesting thing is coming from Nike and having the background in sports and looking at the data of what the next generation is interested in, they don't want to be Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant like previous generations. They want to be Mr. Beast, right? So it's like if, mm. if the next generation of hydration brands is going to be pushing the sports narrative other than Logan Paul and KSI who are obviously doing it, but with a unique angle where their creators turned athletes. Um, right. We feel like our job is to hydrate the next Billie Eilish, not, not the next LeBron. Um, so we're leaning more into how hydration can be a tool for how you feel better on a day-to-day -day basis or how you can be more creative in the studio when you're creating music or whatever that might be, or just chilling and being, uh, you know, having a good time with your friends versus, you know, the sweaty Letterman jacket bro um, that hydration and electrolytes have been positioned for in the past. Um, yeah, no, got that. That makes a ton of sense. And would you say when you guys were coming up with the concept, um, I'm sure you obviously did a, a ton of market research and you guys mentioned, I would say what most people think of when you think of hydration, which is just Gatorade, Powerade, body armor, like the typical bottled beverage. Were you guys also considering, you know, the other boom that's happened kind of alongside that is like powders, for mm -hmm. example, right? So would you say that that's been another kind of like piece to this that was something you guys really considered and looked at was just like powdered hydration, whether it's, you know, the liquid IV stories we've all heard or drip yeah. drop or any of those? I mean, obviously those brands have and products continue to pop up and Liquid IV is just an absolute rocket ship still. Um, yeah. I was actually at Costco this weekend. And it's like the first thing you see in every Costco. It's, it's pretty incredible. Um, it's also incredible, like the the brand recall people have with Liquid IV. Even if they're drinking mm -hmm. another brand, they just call it Liquid IV. It's almost like Kleenex. Uh, so true. It's, it's yeah. pretty incredible. I think one of the things that we know is that RTDs are always going to be there. There are always going to be grocery stores and bodegas and those needs to have something instantly. I think one of the things we've also said too is, yes, you know, it's cheaper to ship. The margins might be better, but they're conveniently inconvenient, right? Like there's moments where you have it and you're like, shit, well, now I need to go find water. Or I need to go find a bottle to put it in. And I have sure. fat thumbs. Oh, yeah. So every time I'm opening it, it's blowing up in my face. <laughs> and I'm coughing up a storm. So I think yeah. there's definitely a place for them, but I think there's an interesting opportunity in the RTD side, um, especially for us too, because we're in a can, which is also very different. Um, you know, traditionally sports drinks and the Pedialyte derivatives, they're all in plastic resealable bottles. Right. We feel like if you're going to come out with a product today and moving forward, you should be trying to mitigate as much plastic as possible. And so we got a lot of feedback um, from advisors like you know do a plastic bottle if you want to switch to aluminum this was also during 2020 when aluminum was impossible to come by um oh, but sure, everyone yeah, was like yeah. you know do plastic you can change to glass or to aluminum down the line we're like no we're just going to do aluminum from the jump and it's, it's really been a big differentiation for us uh and it's helping us open doors actually in the future which we can maybe talk a, lot, a little bit about but i think that's super interesting and something we've also heard is you know liquid iv and the powders Yes, they're cheaper to ship and their, you know, carbon footprint and shipping is probably lower. But a really interesting thing is that stuff does not get recycled. And lots of times it just ends up in the wild. Um, whereas mm. aluminum, 70% of all aluminum in circulation is recycled, which is really exciting. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to continue to win in this, um, this format. I think, too, when we were looking at it, we were lucky to come up in a time where the iOS stuff was kind of happening before we launched and as we launched. We never really had a D2C centric approach, but I think a lot of the powder brands were built off the back of really cheap, easy to target ads. And I think powder doesn't really lend itself to building a brand, like a big brand, whereas a can is a billboard in every point of distribution that it goes to. So I mm -hmm. think difficulty of promoting yourself online from an ad standpoint i think the opportunity is really to build a brand in retail and with you know the can looking entirely different than the category is where we want to go i think there's opportunity to release a powder down the line if the online community or amazon is big enough to support it but i think it's uh it's really easy to launch new products but it's also really easy to lose focus on what the main thing is so i think kind of the mindset that a lot of 
entrepreneurs have put on us is keep the main thing the main thing. So I think we'll be a beverage brand through and through um, for as long as possible. I love that answer because um, it does seem like there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise in that in that space, right? And you guys do have something very differentiated in the can can side. I totally agree. To back up a little bit for you yep. guys, so you know, Steve is is laid up here. He's getting surgery done. You okay. guys think there's an opportunity here for everyone listening? I think I'm, I'm sure a lot of people had the same thought I did, which is you know, four or five weeks to to like come up with a concept, launch a brand. I'm yeah. sure I know I know for a fact it wasn't that yeah. short and like the whole thing. But can you give everyone just a little bit of a little bit deeper of an overview of okay, you guys have this conversation. So many people probably have that conversation every week. Very few actually go to the full other end of the spectrum and are yeah. now selling that said product and, and trying to grow that brand. So can you walk everyone through a little yeah, bit more of the zero to one? I'll give you a timeline. Yeah. So you know, COVID starts March 2020. I drove down to uh, from Portland to Southern California to be with family uh, first week of April because my birthday is April 14th. So I planned it to be like for the month of April, I'll be in SoCal and COVID will be over by the end of April. Uh, right. Obviously, I was wrong. I remember that. that. Yes. Um, so that happens and I'm running a lot because there's nothing else to do, doing yoga, all this stuff. And my hip that had been bugging me for months was finally getting to a point where I was like, OK, I need to figure this out. So I go to the doctor and they're like, yeah, you're going to need to get surgery at some point or else you're going to get arthritis and probably need a hip replacement. Maybe you do it now because you're working from home. And I was like, this is great. I'll do this. Alex and I had already started thinking about this. So I had surgery in June, but I would say we probably started thinking about something in this hydration for not sports space, uh, probably by the end of April, early May. So when I had surgery and I knew I was going to be out for like five or six weeks from working, we started working on what does this actually mean and having conversations with advisors and different people. I mean, we literally started with how to start a beverage brand on Google. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Did you really? Yeah. Yeah. Which was amazing. And we, and we watched YouTube videos and reached out to people basically like snowball from there. Uh, as you know, in this space, there's no textbook on what to do. There are some great books to read, which we can talk about. Um, but there's no, like, these are steps one through 10. Um, so when I say, I was in surgery and that was the timeline. It was like, okay, let's actually, by the end of me having this disability timeframe, let's actually have a sense of what we want to do. That mm -hmm. was 2020. We didn't launch it until end of May, 2022. So it's still two years, right. but um, we made a lot of progress in that timeframe of what we thought we wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, it started in our kitchen too, which was, it, it, the product wasn't the same come launch as it was when we first started. So Really, I, at the time, I was eating a plant-based diet, and I was kind of exploring different superfoods and different things, and Steve introduced me to a couple of things that he had been putting in smoothies, and I was like, well, what if we put it in a lemonade? And so we just started stirring stuff up in the kitchen, and then that kind of led us down this whole this path, which was when we started to think about hydration and really yeah, here's inspired a, the product position. There's a photo of me on crutches in our Oh, wow. Kitchen, Proof. Making <laughs> uh, so. So we're stirring stuff up from June to August of 2020. We start with the professional formulation in October. Um, and yeah, come April 2022, we're producing our first production. Run. And, and in that time, one, one question I really wanted to ask you guys that is so interesting to me. Obviously, I'm intimate with the RX bar story because I know Peter and Jared, how they, they were like literally in a, their parents' basement making a bar. And I've always said this when I've had people on this show is, you know, a protein bar. The one thing interesting about that is, you know, you can get the ingredients at Whole Foods, which is what they did. And then you can go and make it at home for a beverage. Sure. You can like mix it up in a, you know, in whatever, however, putting it into a can and having it sealed and like what people are, what I would say, what most consumers expect when you get a beverage is so much different than a bar where like they started with putting it like a bar that was hand pressed and cut in a Ziploc bag. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that was, that was not something that you needed to go get professional help with for you guys early on. How did you do that part? Like, were you, were you doing it in like some sort of pre-used container? Like I, I always wonder like with canned beverage, it seems like that has to be such an expensive upfront cost to get things canned. Uh, I could be wrong, but I was just curious yeah. how you guys did that early on. You're not wrong. I think, I mean, I think in general <laughs> beverage is super expensive regard, like at any stage. So I think, um, like Steve said, the first thing we did was Google how do you start a beverage brand. 
Second thing was watch a couple of YouTube videos from people at like Expo West or Bed Bed events and starting to kind of just understand what is even going on in the space. We actually ended up reaching out to one of the people in a YouTube video from a BevNet speech. Uh, he ended up advising us and really helped us out in those first you know, year and a half to two years. So connecting us with some of the leading formulators and flavor houses in the natural organic space, um, helping us connect dots with manufacturers and really understand the terminology. Because at the time, neither of us had worked in consumer products, manufacturing or anything. So it was really a crash course every day the first two years and it still is but learning everything that there is um so we worked with a professional formulator she actually spent time in the past at snapple and some other big companies um and then was consulting with a flavor house that we worked with she did a really good job for us and we went to a couple small manufacturers and found the right one to get it going we had some uh crazy mistakes that happened in our first production run that we still haunt us to this day and happy to dive into those stories but you, you do need a little a little chunk of money to really get it going um and we absolutely use the co-manufacturer before selling any products into stores and online did, did you guys um did you do any like market like uh sorry like product market fit did you guys like have anything like handmade that you tested with friends and family before yeah. you went to a co yeah. so we made it to the best of our abilities yeah we made it to the best of our abilities in our home kitchen and we would test it at like family events during the holidays. It never got to a point where it was that enjoyable, to be honest. It, it was, was always yeah. like, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't great, you know? And I think the thing about sure. beverage people were like, this is, this is okay. This is pretty good. Yeah. Maybe they were lying. Uh, I think uh, part, <laughs> of you, part of the thing about beverages is like, a lot of it is in the flavor chemistry and balancing acids, the tartness with the sweetness and the fruit juice with the flavors. And that's something that like, you're not buying a, a lemon extract in the right variety from Ralph's or yeah. Whole Foods. So when we went to the, the right. flavor company, they really helped us balance out lemon juice and vitamin C and some of the different acidities that can affect the flavor. And bricks levels and all these different units of measure that we've mm-hmm. learned in the last two and a half, three years. Like, do you know what a bricks? What bricks? Oh, is? Yeah, I was gonna say, I have no idea what that is. What's a bricks it, level? It's essential. And to be honest, I didn't know for the longest time what it meant. I just nodded my head in the meeting. But they, uh, bricks is essentially the measured amount of solids in a formula. So when you look at all of okay. your solid ingredients outside of water, it's like what, uh, di- like percentage fraction of the solid recipe does it make up, and that really decides a lot of the yield that you have when you manufacture a beverage. Wow. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. See, I'm learning all kinds of stuff here today. Um, okay, got it. So you, you guys go to this co-man, if you don't mind, even if it's a ballpark for people, because I think Bev, to me, beverage is so interesting. Like, how much roughly do you think people need to even do a small run if you're someone who's out there like wanting to start a beverage brand today? Yeah, so I think there's two ways of looking at this. If you're looking to launch a company and start to sell and actually be able to live and exist for a year, as a brand, I think legitimately, like you should plan to have five hundred thousand dollars to do like a full year of marketing, building the brand, producing the product, distributing it, sampling it. You need money to get off the ground. If what you're getting after is let's produce a couple thousand cans just to get feedback, you can really do that for probably less than fifty k from yeah. a formulation branding. And go into a really small co-packer. You just have to be aware if you go that route, you're going to have a negative 100% gross margin. But you're really just going after, mm-hmm. will I get, will people resonate with ingredients and flavor? Um, but that's kind of the two ways that I would look at it from a starting out standpoint. Yeah. Beyond that, you're going to need millions of dollars to be able to succeed at scale. And that's an understatement probably, but that's kind of getting started a good point. Yeah. And for you guys, I mean, this, this gets into the, the weeds of, of just like how you guys thought about structuring the business, you know, obviously Steve's at Nike, one of the largest companies on earth and most well-known Alex, you're over here doing like very creative side, right? Like you're at a, you're at an agency where you're working on TikTok, which at the time TikTok was like, for most people, what's TikTok, 
how is he making probably like curious like how are you, this is a business this is a career how are you making money through tiktok so you guys are like on opposite ends of the spectrum when you guys set out to launch leisure did you guys kind of in your mind know that hey we want to raise a bunch of capital do we were you guys trying to bootstrap it if you could like you guys are both younger in your careers yeah. i'd be curious there's so many people that listen to this that were i've probably been in similar shoes and have wanted to launch a business so i think there's a lot of value in just like how you guys thought through that process because hearing the numbers you're throwing out right that's not that there's you know that there's a lot that goes into even yeah. raising a portion of that let alone getting it up and running with the level of, of capital you would need so we both put five figures into the business and as you know five figures that's a very big range but i'll just i'll just put <laughs> yeah. that out there. it's five figures um love it so we both put five figures in we did raise money from friends and family um really close friends and family but again, to your point, like we knew that we were going to have to raise a lot of money. We have raised some money to date, but we've been very, very scrappy. Like we joke, like we'll talk about it later, but we work with you guys, obviously, uh, with yeah. Like, Amazon. Yeah, yeah. Um, like that's the first marketing, like the, like Amazon ads, it's like the first marketing we've really done. Uh, like we right. have not spent right. any money in marketing, which is really crazy because when i worked at nike i would be in charge of you know half million dollar budgets for these campaigns that are part of 10 million dollar budget product launches so like the fact that i'm not spending any money in marketing but being in charge of this brand's marketing presence has been a really interesting exercise for me and i've definitely learned a lot on how to do things differently i also worked at nike for my first year of the business being in place so from you know, us announcing our launch in the spring of 2022 to April 3rd, 23 of this year, I was still working at Nike. So I'm like juggling zero dollar, negative zero dollars with leisure and hundreds of thousands of dollars on these other campaigns. So um, we knew we were going to have to raise it. Now we're getting in a place where like we actually have a business that's uh, we think very fundable. Um, but we've been very frugal and very thoughtful of how we're spending dollars up until now. And we'll always be that way. I think We've seen a lot of brands launch and crash and burn over the last, uh, I mean, since we started this in 2020. Um, and I think the really interesting thing is we've learned so many different parts of the business of, okay, we're good at this. Maybe we don't need to hire this position. Whereas if we had, you know, $5 million blank check on day one, we would have just hired a bunch of people to do a bunch of things and we wouldn't know. Oh, for sure. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah. 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 And so for both of you, you know, you're at different different parts in your career. You both are obviously extremely bullish on leisure. Can you walk everyone listening today through what those conversations look like for both of you to to leave your respective jobs and jump into this full time? I mean, I, I know both of you have slightly different backgrounds, but both, I mean, huge leaps of faith. And I'm sure I'm sure there were plenty of conversations between you and I know Steve, you're married, so I'm sure significant yeah. other had to be bought into this. So um, would love to just hear your, how your guys' thought process was as you were leading up to both going full-time leisure. Yeah, I think I've always been in my mind, even since a little kid, and Steve can attest this, wanting to be entrepreneurial. And, and I don't think I understood what it meant from a young age, but I've always wanted to be in this sort of position. I think like I used to like, when we were on vacation, I'd ask, the uh the manager at the front desk of the hotel if i could count their coins and count their money they could get paid like i was trying to find ways to just do things that were different than the normal i tried to start a tech company in college with some friends that ended up not really working out but i think for me it was always something that i wanted to get into i think as an athlete i, I was always pursuing it a little bit of a different path on my own where i wanted to be, kind of have an opportunity to build something so for me it was really easy to quit the job the hardest part was giving up a salary. Um, mm -hmm. But I think for me, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm 22 right now at the time. And in my mind, maybe this was reckless or not. I was thinking it was riskier to stay in the job because I want to, as a young person, go out and chase opportunity while I can before I get to get, you know, be too old. And it's a little bit really riskier or a lot more responsibility and i think at the end of the day the amount of stuff that i'm learning is worth more than the salary that i was having at my past job so it's right. kind of making an investment in myself and twofold creating hopefully equity value in the business but also the knowledge and connections that we're making from this is 
she's worth far more than any salary I would have been making the past couple of years. I love that. Yeah, I mean, I I know it's funny. I don't know if I've ever said this publicly on the podcast before, but I've I worked at let me think technically four companies before we started Noble, and every single one of them there were layoffs, and so the first three I scathed through. And then actually the last one, I was in this like weird group of like, I had a job, but it was temporary and like there was a timeline on it. So I was mm-hmm. basically like kind of fired and, and was going to be fired. And um, it's funny now, I mean, when people ask me the same question about Noble, I'm like, to be honest, I think, I think sometimes working for a big corporation, like, yeah, you have a salary, but you can walk in any day, any day and like your entire business, your entire career is, is over. And so mm-hmm. I think it's, it's funny. I feel that a lot, Alex is like entrepreneurship has obviously tons of risk and it's by no means at all, any time, any, at any day safe, but there's something about getting up and building something that like you fully have the impact on versus, you know, and that's just my personal perspective because I've lived through that too. And Steve, what about you? Um, yeah. For you, what, what were some of the conversations that you were thinking? Obviously with the Nike deal too, this, I'm sure that I think you've told me in the past that was kind of like a dream job for you. Yeah, I mean, totally. Like, as an athlete who's who wanted to be in marketing and advertising, like Nike is the job. Like, there is no other job that's even on a pedestal. Like, whether it's Adidas or Under Armour, like they just don't compete. I have a lot of friends at those brands, so if they hear this, I'm talking about you. Um, <laughs> but you know, for me, we knew that one of us was going to have to go full time. It made a lot of sense that it was going to be Alex um, pretty early on, just his excitement not not that i wasn't excited but his excitement for starting the brand and just his really early on understanding of things that we needed to do in year one um it made Mm -hmm. sense that it was him it also made sense for me to stay at nike because in my role at nike when i was leaving it was about community marketing in los angeles and when i was at nike we weren't doing any events because it was covid restrictions in los angeles oh yeah, there's so that detail. There, uh, it was, it was, um, you know, there was a lot of free time. Um, I wasn't in the, I didn't have to be in the office until the last few months in the job. Uh, but really, when I jumped, there was this moment in time where it just made too much sense to jump ship. We had just gotten into a CPG accelerator called SKU. They're based in Austin. Um, that was starting on Expo West, so I took PTO. Uh, for Expo West, I came back that Monday and I basically resigned and I gave uh, I gave my two weeks, but I just stayed around for another couple of weeks because I wanted to extend my health insurance. Didn't really matter because I thought, yeah, you know, that's another thing, too. When you get past a certain age, uh, you know, you can't if you were on your parents, you can't go back uh, and you got to start doing health insurance. So I was trying to extend that for a while. Um but it just made sense to go all in. Uh, in hindsight, I probably should have stayed like two or three more weeks because I had some stocks that were about to vest. And if I would have made it to the end of May, uh, I would have gotten a bonus. Um, but yeah. in hindsight, yeah. it's fine. You know, the opportunity cost of of fake working at Nike for another month or two yeah. uh, was much higher than just jumping ship. So we did that accelerator. We had a really amazing summer. Uh, and now we're on Amazon. So now the world's ours. Hell yeah. Love that. Love that. No, I love it. Seriously. That's great. Um, so you guys, obviously you both jump ship. What is it like, you know, first week, were you guys in the same location at that point? So you guys are, you know, whether it's office home, I know, I know your situation now, but what was it back then when you both jumped? Like what's, what's that, what's that first week where all of a sudden we're, Hey, Steve and Alex are both full-time leisure. Yeah. So (laughs) what was it like? I don't remember. Well, so I went full-time a year before. So I quit my job right before we launched. So I've been going at it for a year. I'll take it back to that moment just briefly. Right when I quit my job and we're about to have our first production run, I decided I'm not in LA. (laughs) I have to be in LA to launch the business because all of our efforts are going to be in LA to start. So the day before my production run, I'm moving into a new new apartment and getting on a getting on a getting in a car and driving out to Vegas for our first run. But I mean, the first week of him being full time was, I think in the beginning, it was figuring out how we're going to start to allocate our time and then what the responsibilities are going to be split up. I think before he quit, it was kind of like, 
we were all doing everything and kind of switching between things. Yeah. Between things. I think it gave us time after the accelerator and him being full time to be kind of honing in on where we're going to focus. So I, I took the full time role into the operations side of it. He went the full time thing into marketing. We still help each other out on those things when when we need to. Um, but I, I mean, the first week was kind of getting adjusted. But you know, one month in, I think Steve looked to me and said, "I I don't know how we were doing this before not having full time because." As I'm sure you have with your agency, when you first start, it's a little bit slow. You're trying to figure it out, get it going. But things start to build month over month, quarter over quarter. And it, you look back three months ago and you're like, this is a completely different world that we're living in. So I think it was the right timing for sure. It was the right timing. And I mean, I think like I was very lucky that I was in a situation in my last job at Nike where it was a little bit of like, I can do this with at least one hand tied behind my back most days. Um Towards the end, it started to get a little bit more complicated because the world was opening up and Nike was more open to doing things in person. But I think the reality is, is any distraction you have away from what your goal is, is so great. No matter how many hours you like, if it's if it's 10 hours a week, if it's 20 hours a week, you know, whatever like you're just wasting your brain. So I was like wasting mm -hmm. my creative side in these meetings for projects that weren't going to happen for the next six months when I could be doing all that thinking about how we're going to take the brand to the next level and get it ready to scale, which is where we're kind of getting close to now. Um, so if I wouldn't have left when I left, I think we'd be in a rough spot now. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I think that it's great to go all in, but I also know that like not everyone can do that. And I think if you're going to do something and you have two co-founders, one of them should probably be all in um, mm -hmm. and obviously rewarded on the back end of what that means. Um, sure. But, you know. No, it makes sense. It makes sense. It's, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very exciting story. And, and for you guys, you know, making that jump, I, I've obviously I've been through it too and it's, it's nothing to, to like gloss over or, or lightly address. It's a big deal. And for you both, it sounds like you're both fired up about it. I could see how both of you, it sounds like Alex from the get, you know, it was like, he, he's always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Steve, you have a dream job. So leaving that. So for you guys, was there, you know, Alex jumping in a, a year earlier, it sounds like at that point, you know, you're just doing your first production run. There's like no revenue yet. Steve, for you, was it was there like a revenue goal or anything where you kind of like, hey, I need to see a little bit of success here before I can just like leave Nike? Or did you both, were you both, again, just sold on the concept, sold it on was, the idea, and you knew I that, think that... It was more, I think it was more feedback from consumers um, and industry and all the, you know, not the gatekeepers, but the, all the different people that you need to have saying yes to get authorizations. Yeah. Um, you know, revenue is one thing, but if it's like, spread out over a bunch of different accounts like that doesn't really matter um i think we got to a place with our brand where we had made a couple iterations on flavor we had made some iterations on uh package design um before we got to where we are now which we're really excited about um and it got to a place where like where alex and i so air one was the first grocery store we got into and i'm sure a lot of nice. people know air yeah one. that's a great one on this so i'm not going to go too deep into it but alex and i are just at the one in venice who's down the street from my old apartment and alex is going in there and re-merchandising things which if you know anything about Erwan, you usually don't have to re-merchandise because their staff is all over it they do a really great job at that um but alex is doing it and counting and saying like oh like let's see how many we sold this week and this woman wait you were wait I, alex is counting how many cans are left to yeah, then he's a psycho. do the math uh he's he's all over it um, but, <laughs> i love so that we're, we're in there and this woman uh kind of bumps kind of shoulder checks alex and he kind of looks at her like what the hell like i'm six four alex is six two like we're pretty big dudes oh yeah well you guys are both okay see this is funny i'm not to cut you off yeah because we're sitting right there's been people kyle and i meet at expo and we're like I did not think you were either that tall or that short. I didn't realize you, but you're both tall. You're way taller than me. I'm six foot. So you, I, I don't know why I would have never thought you guys were that tall. I got tiny ears. That's what I've been told. That's, <laughs> that's why people can't tell on zoom calls. But anyways, uh, so we're, we're, we're at the, at the beverage wall and this woman kind of shoulder checks Alex and he looks at her like, what, what the heck is going on? Yeah. And she's like, can I get a blueberry? And Alex <laughs> was like, yeah, sure. And 
then he's like after he like gets goes from being stunned he's talking to her and she's like i wish i had this film it was such an amazing moment and she was saying like yeah i come here pretty much every day on my lunch break uh, i have it after coffee so i have my coffee in the morning and then for my lunch break i'll come and get this to have with my uh lunch at my desk she worked down the street and we just started asking her questions about all these things like why do you like it and she's like i like to be rehydrated and it makes me feel like more myself all this stuff i was like that's really cool like if this product went away, that one individual would have a worse life, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We started to right. have more and more conversations like that in person, at events, you know, DMs. Oh. I had one like this with a um, a woman who's a first grade teacher, and she said that she used to. <laughs> we got doggy barking. Uh, she used to. Um, basically, she used to have leisure in the afternoons, like one to two p.m. before the kids would leave. And it was a way for not only to rehydrate, but she really felt the the functional benefits of leisure. So the oh, magnesium, yeah, the nice. ashwagandha. So she was like, it was a way for me to feel like I had like a half a glass of white wine in the middle of the afternoon that was like chilling me out, but still could be a productive member of society. So we had these like these moments of people who like, if the product went away, it would be pretty detrimental to these people. And so it got to a point where I was like, okay, skew is bringing us in. We have these people that are into it. We're talking to these, all these other retailers that might want to bring us in. Like if I don't jump now, I'm going to really kick myself in a couple months. And all um, along the way, I'm in his year telling him he needs to quit his job. Yeah. Because I've seen the writing on the wall. Like we need a hundred percent time from two people to get this going. So when it finally happened, it was, uh, somewhat of a sigh of relief but then the workload only gets bigger so it ends up being like you know everyone's still already entirely busy but i think there's too many things you need to do to make an early stage scrappy budget startup work there's too many fires to put out last second deliveries things that you need to drive to to fix to where if you don't have two people full time it almost makes it impossible to solve those problems 100 percent of the time so that was really helpful and then i think that's what Really why you need to start fundraising is you need to put some capital into the business to help solve some of these problems, to bring on some people to the team to help alleviate stress and become more efficient. So that's kind of the process that we're in right now after raising some money is starting to outsource where we really need it so that we can focus on what we're good at. Totally makes sense. Yeah. And for for you guys, I'm sure you probably ran into this while Steve was still working at Nike, but there's probably... There's got to be, there had to have been days where something in Alex's world was urgent and Steve's caught up in back to back meetings or however that works at Nike, right? Like the, the normal corporate calendar would look. And all of a sudden, something that Alex probably thinks should be, you know, this is like a morning, like, let's knock this out, get this done, turns into, well, Steve's got to handle it at like six o'clock at night. Um, over time, that does just slow things down, right? So you can totally see. Honest. I was, again, I was in a really lucky position in my last role uh, where there weren't a lot of those. And so that's why I was like, okay, let me okay. just on for another couple months until this gets crazy. If I would have stayed a little bit longer for that bonus, there was a project that I was going to have to do that was going to be a bitch. Uh, sorry for swearing on the yeah. phone. That's allowed. But, no, you can swear. Uh, that's fine. No, fuck it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I left, I, honestly, I left as probably the last day I could have because if I would have had to work on that project, it would have not been fun. And I think that what you're kind of getting at, I think, <clears throat> happen in more subtle ways than you're describing. It's yeah, like, totally. For example, like Steve oversees all creative. So anything photo shoots, branding, he's leading those projects, organizing the files. So like if we had a need to find a file for a certain thing that I don't understand and never looked at, and if it creeps over to another day, that might lead to a weekend, which leads to another day, which the supplier doesn't respond for 72 hours for some reason, it can create a snowball. Um, that I think now we've started to really close that gap where we can move on things really quickly. For ex I mean, the best example of this is now that we have some distribution, the second someone wants a sample, we go on Instacart immediately with mm. an email and we send them samples. They have it within an hour. I think in the past it was like, okay, well. Oh, that's we really smart. We, we, I mean, you'd gloss right through that. That's, I have never heard of someone say that. That's that. such a smart idea. We can talk about that because it's like, <laughs> wow, it's worth every penny for the priority shipment to get it in an hour. 
So the well, biggest... wait, like, like, give us an example of someone you've done yeah. that. Like, don't give specifics, but like, it's like a buyer or someone who's yeah. like, I really want to try it, and you're like, yeah. oh, don't worry, I'll get it to you in like an hour. Buyers, distributors. Um, so that deal, that deal that you know about, happened. Yeah. 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 Within an hour, we were getting connected to the distributor. From when we that got that is the email, brilliant. Like brilliant. So like, yeah. because they, how many people have a great zoom call and then by the time they get the sample out, it goes week. to an office, like maybe that person sees it and they have 15 on their desk. Yeah. Wow. Really smart. It. I think like if you don't strike while the iron's hot, it's people are going to forget about you because they don't really need you or care about you. But if the second someone's 100% enthusiasm in your offering your business, if you can keep momentum moving you can get deals done hopefully quicker so like some of these distribution deals that we've told you about we're not really publicly talking about have happened because momentum happened and all within a week the deal was practically done yeah i mean it's it less than super quick. it's less than three months since that insta that that fateful instacart <laughs> wow yeah i mean that's that's seriously that that's gonna be that's probably gonna be the clip of this podcast that's like the that's like coolest insight because it's so yeah. true i mean especially some of these people you're talking about, you know, we, we can dive into it, but the buyers, distributors, like those people, they talk to so many brands that it's so, yeah. it has to be so easy. And like, it shows up a week or even a few days later and they're probably like, uh, trying to think back to the conversation, maybe even, you know, who knows how well notes those guys or girls are taken. Um, that's wild. Yeah. It's a huge one. So, so for, so for you guys, you, you know, you jump full time, um, we could jump into e-com in a minute too. I think it'd be really interesting. And there's some really cool insights we could all talk about with Amazon. Um, what for you guys though, knowing, you know, your canned beverage again, you know, I've told you my world in, in protein bars being a little bit different path to market and what's more economical. What was your guys' overarching strategy? Like out the gate, like were, were you guys thinking like, we want to go retail first? Do we, I was just so curious on like how you guys have thought about the the coming to market for leisure and where, where are the right places at the right times for you being a canned hydration beverage? Yeah, I think so early on, there are kind of two things going on, which we can choose to dive into deeper maybe after this. But so the craziest thing is we actually launched the business as an NFT project so in the <laughs> NFT boom. Something That's we don't right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we were the yeah, You should dive into that because you, you gave me the high level of this the first time we met and I thought it was yeah. so unique. So in December of 2021, well, let me back it up. Let me back it up from even there. Yeah. So we basically had our product position, product positioning, brand positioning, and then we had zero dollars for marketing. And we're not celebrities. We're not famous athletes. We're not influencers. We don't have a lot of close friends that are any of those things. So we were like, what is a way to build a community that cares about us besides our mom and friends uh, before we launch? And this right. was in summer 2021. Uh, which was like NFT summer. And I started to just get infatuated from like a sociological marketing standpoint of like, this is incredible what's happening. Obviously there's been a lot of bad actors in that space. Sure. Um, yeah. But basically I was seeing these brands go from not even an idea that anyone knew to a, like a billion dollar business uh, overnight. And so we were like, okay, if we're going to build community for a brand, this is the way that's going to happen in the future. And obviously that's worked in some cases. It hasn't worked in a lot of cases. Um, but so we launched uh, a concept of essentially a membership program. Um, but you had this token, this non-fungible token that proved that you knew about us before we ever existed and perks a little bit TBD, but always have a discount on our website. Um, first access to product all these different types of things, opportunities to co-create future flavors, all these different types of things. And it was honestly right place, right time. And looking back on it, our, our first tweet was like incredible. We tweeted on Christmas Eve and it was like this time where like no one was tweeting about NFTs or crypto or CPG or anything, but everyone was consuming it. Like when oh, they were escaping okay. their family on Christmas Eve to like just get a breath of fresh air or whatever, they were all on Twitter. And we went from having no tweets and no followers to like pretty much overnight, like a couple thousand followers and all oh, these wow. and different people like DMing us saying like, who are you? Like, who's funding you? Like, what's all this stuff? I'm like, we're just two brothers that have an idea. Um, 
so that's kind of how it started and we did an nft launch um we have about uh what is that a thousand nfts that we minted for roughly 400 holders around the world predominantly in the us and canada um and so we did that we launched in march of 2022 which was you know about a month before our production run um but it was really cool i mean we still have people like in our discord it's not the most active um but we have people reaching out saying like hey i just saw it in chicago at foxtrot or i saw it at central market in in houston uh glad to see you guys are showing like glad you're legitimate uh you know because sure whole, yeah, yeah yeah the whole part of the nft was trying to make people and you see this on tiktok really work and, and i think it somewhat relates is people are following the founders of these brands on tiktok and following their journey and we wanted to give people the opportunity to be a part of the journey before it ever existed and yeah. in some ways co-create it to be bought into it on a deeper level and we ended up selling at the time, Ethereum was worth a lot more than it ended up crashing down to. But, you know, we, we sold over six figures of NFTs on our launch. And we used wow. that to fund production a couple months later. So those people's NFT purchases directly impacted the launch of a company, a brand. They then got free product. And it's been really cool from there. I think it's become less of a core focus of our business, but I think we still believe NFTs will be a big thing in the future. So I think we have the infrastructure and knowledge of how to execute it when the time is right. We've kind of sidelined that as the core of our business because we are, at the end of the day, selling beverages and need to win in retail. But I think that kind of leads into um, our retail strategy. But I'll let you jump in and ask any questions that you wanted to before. I yeah, ahead. I mean, I, th I was hoping you guys were going to tie it at the end there and say it helped with your first production run. I assumed it did, which I think is like the coolest way to fund something in this space. Um, yeah, it's funny when you. I remember even when you guys had, we first met and you guys were talking about the NFT project. I still feel even at that time it was still it was still kind of hyped up. Like it was still definitely like it's more so than now. Like I feel like it's definitely cooled yeah. off a little bit. Um, but what a cool idea! And honestly, I'm surprised that since then and probably a little bit of its timing and just you know what's transpired in that space over the last twelve months. But it seems like such an awesome idea to let people into a brand at its earliest stage, get all these benefits that could last you, you know, well into them becoming these huge brands that they could turn into. So I think you guys did something really, really unique and cool that, that I, I'd be shocked if there's not going to be a lot more of these in the future. Uh, it seems like a, a super obvious one that I would be shocked that there's not more brands that, that do it. For, for people who got into it, have you had very many of them sell them or most of them holding on to it to try to see if, do you know? I don't know if you can track that. I, I honestly don't know enough about NFTs. I think we did a good job of positioning it as like most NFTs at the time were pump and dumps or like, let's make a ton of money quick. And from the very jump, we were like, this is a 10 plus year project. We're trying okay. to get the next big hydration brand. If you're looking to make $10,000 off this NFT, do not buy it. So we were basically portraying this as in 10 years we want to be a huge brand that's having a really big impact at the time it was kind of like we're building the gatorade for creatives was like the positioning towards that community cool and if yeah. we build that brand with your support we're going to be having amazing events and activations and collaborations that you're going to have access to input on and be a part of so i think there's definitely been some people that ignored that and tried to buy something that they thought would be unique and make money and people have sold it but i think for the most part it's been pretty steady yeah. because we are a business we're not there's substance beyond a monkey on a screen <laughs> or any of the apes that we're selling for right dollars so i think that kind of helps with that um and they were our first subscribers on our website or when we launch a new, a new market there's often an nft holder that'll find it in a random bodega or in the grocery store so it's kind of that network effect that's helped us since then and kind of um it's just it's so different from our core retail focus which we can get yeah. into yeah i've always thought that if brands could do what you just said which is leverage them for like in the short term discounts on the website you know exclusive content early access to all the things you guys hit on but really to me where it seems like it would make the most sense is live events if you guys ever wanted to do like a, something at expo west and you had someone come i don't know I'm just throwing something stupid out, but like, you know, you had someone come to perform at this like private show and you needed a leisure NFT to get in. 
that to me makes so much sense, especially as you keep growing. Like you could see how that could go up in price, and then you guys benefit from that, and it just drives a lot of hype. And it's a great way to market it. It seems like that's a brilliant way that even in the future could still be leveraged to me, at least. Totally. So for you guys going into retail, um, you said Air One, obviously. What were some of the other early locations that you guys were really trying to get into and, and drive leisure to? In the earliest days, it was just Air One, and the strategy was. Let's get in Erwan and let's get into a couple of the cafes and influential shops around it. And all we wanted to do was get feedback. At the time, it was just me full time and Steve at Nike. And we were like, we're just going to demo until we can't demo anymore. So we were in those stores sampling hundreds and hundreds of times. I think we've done over 300 samplings in the first 18 months, us two combined. Most of that wow. being in the first 12 months. Yeah. So there were days where I would go. I remember one week specifically where I went lunch and dinner demos back to back for five straight days. So essentially, wow. spending, you know, like 48 hours of my week within an air one. The whole goal of that was what do people think of the flavor? How do we talk about this product? And from those experiences, we tweak the packaging and the flavor. In the flavor four different times, and it's now in a spot where our weekly velocity average at Erwan specifically is higher than it was when we were demoing 10 times a week. So we're not having to pour on any samples, and it's selling at the same rate. So that kind of established it for us. From there, we went to Bristol Farms and Lazy Acres, um, got into a couple food service small chains down here in LA, and we were in SoCal for the first seven or eight months. Um, and then we slowly expanded to Northern California and we're really trying to saturate the West coast, specifically natural specialty. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, we were just focused on how much can we learn? How can we change the product to better fit the needs of consumers? And I, I we really didn't know how to message the product. So we learned a lot about how to communicate benefits to people over that time frame. Yeah. I think the like we talked about aluminum cans earlier, like it's a huge benefit for us to be sustainable, but it's also a, a problem because the consumer is assuming it's an energy drink or a kombucha or maybe even a craft beer. Um and then the merchandising team, if they don't have it planogrammed, they also don't necessarily know what it is. So that's where we oh, got to a yeah. place where we started being very clear that it's hydration, it's electrolytes, it's a refresher. So people would place it not next to you know, a Celsius or <laughs> something that's going to get yeah. your Yeah. I never thought about it like merchandising actually doing the wrong, putting it in the wrong yeah. place. I never would have we thought the, about that. We were one of the first, if not the first electrolyte drinks in a can, uh, over, you know, that's coming out. There's been a few that have come out since and there will be continue. I mean, pretty much every brand that's coming out now is going to be in a can. And there's a lot of brands that are switching over to cans, um, because they're getting kicked out of places because they're plastic. Um, so it's going right. to become more normal, the same way liquid death normalized water in a can. Um, but right, you know, right, right. you're a first or early mover, you have um, those issues. So we're, we've no, been working. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So, for, so for you guys, I mean, you're you're not doing, a, you weren't doing a ton of marketing or mm -hmm. any marketing, yeah. and you're doing a lot of like boots on the ground. Was that was boots, boots on, on the, the ground, ground, and then social media really like the 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 bulk of of Our getting the brand was, out? we need to go slow as we can so we can learn as much as we can before we spend hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars, but go fast enough where we're showing momentum in the snowball effect, um, both to ourselves of these people that are quitting their jobs to go full time, but then also to the eventual investor that we have to speak to. Um, so yeah, boots on the ground. We do a lot of events in LA. Um, again, okay. we slowed down a little bit, uh, at the end of the year, but you know, Memorial day to labor day, like we're out there. Um, the two of us, whether it's at the event, pouring out samples or, you know, uh, community organizers coming by now our headquarters, um, which is just our garage. But uh, yeah, you know, I would love cool. it's so cool. Um, we have them coming by picking up cans and, you know, we're starting, you know, we had this really targeted focus with Erewhon specifically where we're like, OK, we need to be in the cafes that are in striking distance. But then also, like, if there's events that are happening in those, like, we need to, like, reach out to people on social and get them free product. Um, so that was really huge for us. And I think, like, there's a few doors in L.A. where that's really blown up. Like, Erewhon Venice is a great door for us. Uh, the new Lazy Acres in Los Feliz is a, is a great account for us. And, like, it's those, like, you only need... 
you know, 80%, you need 80% of your volume coming from 20% of your doors. And when you have right. a couple of those in, in your key accounts, um, it just, it really like snowball effects. And that's, so our strategy from a, like, how do we get moving in retail is to put as much of your resources towards as close to the consumer and the point of sale as possible. So in the beginning, it was pouring samples and then going to where that core consumer is going for, where they play, where they eat, where they uh, commune. So wellness events, art events, uh, donating to different food events and really getting product in hands. We actually, a couple months ago, imposed like an internal mandate that we have to give a, out a certain amount of cases for free to a local events per month. So oh, okay. A pallet of each flavor in our garage. And we want a pallet essentially close to a pallet being gone every single month for free to events getting cans in hands and that's been really important for us from a local a local level of really ensuring that people are trying the brand and experiencing it in the moment where it makes sense and do you guys think that this is extra important for the founders to do this in your experience if you would have hired field marketers to do the same thing? Does it do even an ounce of what you think it happens when you two are doing it? Well, I think the biggest thing, I think sometimes uh, it can somewhat be overblown of the impact of a founder talking to a consumer. I think people will think it's cool to meet the founder and try the product and maybe they'll support it if they're that type of person. I think the most important thing is you hearing how consumers describe your product. So the the best thing you hear is when someone likes it and they go run and bring their friend over. And instead of explaining the product, you listen to that person explain it to their friend. And you mm -hmm. learn a lot about what people care about and what they understand. I think when we launched, we have trendy ingredients like magnesium and ashwagandha, L-theanine, things that biohackers or wellness people take. What we learned is that like ashwagandha sounds like a crazy drug to a lot of people that don't know what it is. And I, what we kept hearing is like people understand what a vitamin water is, what a Gatorade is. They know electrolytes. They know low calorie. They know real fruit. So really focusing on where you can be simple and then expanding from there has been important. Um, and then secondarily is if you hire a bunch of people from day one, it's hard to lead with empathy because you don't know the struggles they're going through. So I think for us is like, Steve, who runs marketing, has kind of developed a system for activating that event. Our first event, it took us like three hours, <laughs> three hours to clean, yeah. to set up and then clean up. And oh my God. It's like, he has a system that we can then tell someone, if we do an event, you do it this way. It represents the brand and you won't waste your whole day setting it up and cleaning it, breaking it down. So oh, so like setting up like the tent and the, getting the drinks ready took three hours? Yeah. Yeah. And all this... Yeah, just too much POS. I mean, even small things like how to pack the car. Like, obviously, someone learns oh, it sure. over time, yeah. but like, now you realize, oh, well, it's not going to cost someone only those. You know, if you're paying for someone, it's not going to be those three hours that they're supposed to be at the event. It's all the time of packing the car. All this is like, okay, maybe we don't want to invest in this stuff. We need, we don't have the money to do this correctly. If we're hiring people, we need to continue to do this for a little bit longer. Um, but I think also too, like we got a couple authorizations into other accounts just by being the people pouring samples. Like we got into uh, Boba Guys, which is a, a boba tea chain uh, in California. Like they sample, Alex sampled the guys. They reached out like six months later when they were doing their beverage review and we were in their fridge. We've been in their fridge since. Um, so there's nice. opportunities. Okay. Like, there's a lot of serendipity that happens when a founder is there um, or like an early employee. Um, so I think field marketing is super important. It's something we definitely want to tap into, but we're just not there yet to, to outsource it. No, that makes sense. I mean, I, I think for most people listening who haven't directly been a part of a young CPG brand, probably don't realize like how, how little, I don't, I don't want to downplay how much you're in front of your computer because I, I know you guys work a ton, but <laughs> you have to actually be out, like you said, cans and hands. Yeah you're not just in an office from eight to five. It's it's like, I think for a lot of people who listen and are thinking about getting into the CPG space, uh, that's probably one of the things that was the biggest surprise to me. I know when I joined our X bar even was like how much we were still out going to CrossFit gyms and giving out bars. Uh, I was like, Oh wow. I never thought about it. Like if you're not this major, huge brand that's on every shelf and every store, uh, people obviously just don't know who you are. So you got to go, go meet them and show them and, and show them the product. Yeah. I mean, that's totally true, but we've definitely found ways to like, 
slow that down because LA sucks to drive across, especially in the middle of the day. Um, so sure. like, you know, just like small things of like, yeah, maybe it costs some money, but Uber courier, some packages to someone or have them send stuff to you with Uber courier. That's been a huge unlock for us. I mean, 20 bucks versus me being wow. in the car for an hour and a half. Like I'd rather pay 20 bucks. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. Between. Okay. So Uber courier and Instacart, huge. two huge unlocks today yeah. on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. That's something for us. So like, for example, to get to our formulator, cause we're constantly speaking, it can take three hours round trip the traffic so I, i'm paying 35 dollars to have it delivered and for me it's like once you raise a little bit of money and you're starting to get busier as a founder you need to like evaluate where do i need to just grind through it and where is it going to provide more value long term to outsource and i think from a smallest scale is like do i need to be driving for three hours or should i use three hours to my advantage by just getting a courier and i think down the line that comes to like you know we just brought on a a, a half-time operations lead it got to the point where i'm like if i'm having to manage every truck bringing an ingredient to a production run in every part of that process how are we ever going to raise money i'll have no time so i think it's it's finding the right moment to pull trigger on some of those things that can exponentially improve the business yeah I mean, that makes a ton of sense. And as a growing business, I'm, I'm sure you guys are faced with that constantly. For people listening who, who that, that, for me, that really sparked a question of like, how do you two as co-founders kind of sit down and evaluate, you know, what's worth just putting your headphones in and knocking the work out? And, and where are there areas where, you know, you're outsourcing or hiring or, or finding another solution? Like, do you guys have like a pretty, pretty solid process between the two of you to kind of decide what's worth the money and what's not? I think we're still working on that. I think it's kind of like it's as it comes, you evaluate it. I think you need to make a decision to be able to pivot quickly. Um, you can overanalyze everything in a million different <laughs> ways. You know, what, what broker do you want to go with? What do you want a bookkeeper? Do you not want a bookkeeper? I think um, it's taking it as it comes and we have a discussion and we kind of, sometimes we argue about it because we're passionate about our own sides of it. But I think it's really just evaluating does this matter for right now in the business? Does this have an impact on the next 12 months? And really looking at it from like, will this help us stay alive longer? Because that's really the only thing that matters yeah. is are the lights still on? Um, because, you know, you can overanalyze everything, but if you run out of money or run out of time, you're screwed. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, one thing I, I know we're, uh, I'll, I'll try to like get through some important parts for you guys to be conscious of your time, but the, one of the things I thought would be really interesting to dive into, you guys, you know, you glossed over a little bit. You both put some money in. You, you did raise some capital. I mean, for everyone that listens to the podcast, I talk about it constantly. From this, again, anecdotal stories I hear and I read and the folks that I talk to, you know, the last 12 to 15 months has been brutal as far as raising capital and, and CPG, especially food and beverage. So for you guys, obviously, you have found some success there, which is, is first of all, hats off to you guys because I, again, I, I would tell you, nine out of 10 people I talked to, I've been in the other camp. So for you guys, what was that process like? And any tips for people who are maybe in the thick of it right now, um, who are trying to keep the lights on, um, on things that really worked for you guys. And, and it could be as simple as, you know, your guys' numbers look great and you have an awesome story and, and the product's fantastic, but be curious if there's anything else that you guys think were, were kind of like, you know, really important building blocks for you guys to be able to like take that next step as a business. Yeah, I think Part of this goes back to what Steve said about like field marketing and getting out there is if you don't put yourself in a position to get lucky, you never will. And I think there's been a lot of serendipity of putting ourselves in a position to get lucky. And we just did. We, we found multiple advisors through direct messages on either Instagram or LinkedIn, both of which ended up investing. They weren't the biggest investors, but they've led to, I mean, for our stage, huge investments. So I think there was a point where I was like, I don't know how we're going to raise all this money. And I started DMing people on LinkedIn and one Zoom led to another Zoom. And that Zoom led to someone who has a big net worth and believes in the vision. And that can lead to a, a business changing outcome, which was the case for a couple of our checks. I think one thing that we've really discovered is that you need, you need to have a story that is interesting and can generate buy-in for a core belief of the business. And I think we're trying constantly in the early stage, trying to create 
momentum around things in our business that make us unique and investable. And I think part of that has been recently the sustainability angle with the, the single, no single use plastic. I think we're getting a lot of unique distribution angles that has allowed us to gain momentum. I think from a brand positioning standpoint, we're connecting a lot of what we're building the business off of to core insights that Steve got from Nike, some of the biggest brands in the world are, are going through. And that allows us to tell a story that from a big picture has a large TAM and seems like something people can get behind. Um, All right, we're back. We're back. Um, I had a little Wi-Fi cut out. Actually, this is great. This is, we should have done this from the start. This looks great on one screen. Yeah, let's get a little. And you can like fully see that your your brother. Ah, there we go. There we go. Love it. All right, we're we're back. We um trying to think back. I just lost my train of thought. Where were we? We were talking about fundraising and tips. And yes. Tricks. Yep. 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 You were about to drop some knowledge, and then it cut out. So did I get into anything that I was? Uh, no, getting? I heard you say. I heard you say like you about to. You were about to say the first thing, and then it, it paused on my end. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we we'll started. So I think. It was going back to what Steve had said about field marketing and kind of getting out there. Uh, there's a lot of serendipity. And what I had said is if you don't put yourself in a position to get lucky, you never will. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of where, I mean, some of our most impactful money has come from DMs on Instagram and LinkedIn that have led to Zoom calls, which led to another Zoom call, which leads to a connection to another connection. And we've got a couple of really, I mean, our lead investor in our latest round was a connection of a connection of a connection. So it was three removed from an initial LinkedIn DM. Um, and from there, that gives you the momentum you need to bring in some other people. Um, and I think the second thing I was getting into around fundraising is you need to be telling a story that is interesting and something that people can buy into from a vision standpoint. So I think from us kind of building off of a couple core theses was one is a sustainability angle with the can and really being unique and differentiated, which is allowing us to get unique distribution opportunities where single use plastic is either getting banned, reduced, or it just isn't preferred. Um, I think from a brand positioning standpoint, we're working off a lot of big insights that used to be not understood, but I think are becoming much more understood with the data that's coming out and Steve working at Nike. So I think really telling the story of how generations are shifting, both from a health standpoint, people care a lot more about how they feel mentally than having a six pack. And that's mm -hmm. part of our brand positioning is, uh, the story is Gatorade's telling you to go faster and to work harder to be a champion. And we're telling you to go at your own pace, take care of yourself, feel better mentally. And I think we're telling a generational story that the, the mindset is shifting from hustle culture and bro culture to this relaxed, pursue your passions, feel your best mindset that I think our brand and brand name represents. And people are seeing that vision. Um, and it's, it, you can just buy into it. Um, and I think that's really important. You don't want to be the 55th kombucha talking about gut health. And there are plenty of hydration drinks, but I think having a couple really big bets that are macro trends behind you yeah. helps tell a story that people can buy into a big tam so i think that's kind of where where we've tried to lean into but i'd be lying if i told you we were great at it and i would be lying if i told you that it wasn't luck because it is luck but i believe that you create your own luck yeah i love that i mean just just the the tenacity of you know dming through linkedin i think sometimes that even goes a little unnoticed, right? Like there's so much opportunity out there, even when what you hear in the headlines and, and macro stories say things are so bad. I would argue that, not to say a lot of those people haven't tried hard enough, but to some degree, I think you can always keep trying uh, and try harder and, and keep talking and keep networking and keep trying and keep trying. And so it's really interesting that you feel like that was a big part. Um, love the branding and the, and the direction. I do agree that you guys definitely, from a beverage space, I think, it's very differentiated in that regard, right? It's like the, the actual brand feel you get with leisure and, and what you get, the way you speak online is just way different than what you're seeing out there. So I, I definitely resonated with it. I know that's one of the reasons we, we initially started talking. Um, so for you guys, you know, retail, getting boots on the ground was a focus. Um, we talked about it a little bit in the beginning, but launched on Amazon, which has been exciting over the last really almost two months already now. 
Um, for you guys, what does the next one year, three years look like for leisure? Where are you guys leaning in for people listening? You know, where are people going to start seeing leisure pop up, whether you're listening to this on the coast or in the middle of this country? Yes, yeah, so we're at about 350 stores today, primarily in California. So split up between like the greater Los Angeles area and the greater San Francisco area. Um, we're in a couple of retailers like Central Market out in Texas, Foxtrot in Chicago, DC in Texas. We'll start to expand along the West Coast. So from Seattle down to San Diego next year. And our focus for the next 12 months is really on two things. It's food service. So alternative channels of distribution. We like to think of it as marketing that makes money. Um, mm -hmm. So how can we get paid to build brand awareness? So you could think, you know, restaurants, cafes, offices are all places that we want to play and are really different than our competitors from a sports drink perspective. So we're not, we don't necessarily want to be on the football field, but we want to appear where there really aren't other hydration drinks. Um, secondarily is what Steve runs on Amazon and working with you guys is focusing on building online where people convert the easiest is we, and we, we joke, we have friends that never bought the product before. And the second we went on Amazon and it was two day delivery, they, they bought it. Cause it's so easy. Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> wild? It was, it's what it legitimizes the brand. Yeah. It's, yeah. Oh, it's, cool. it's weird we how, website. how like even, even a couple of years ago, it felt important to be on Amazon. And I would argue it's gotten it like every year, it seems like 10 times more important from a brand perspective, more so than anything else. To have a, have a legitimate showing on there. It's crazy. I mean, you want to be where consumers are and make it easy for them. So right. like even on our website, like what we worked on with you is, you know, we're offering buy with prime on the website is you want to get, you want to reduce the friction to trial. Um, so if someone wants to buy on Amazon, just let them buy on Amazon. Right. Um, and I think the third focus kind of on retail is we don't want to go into 5,000 stores next year. We don't want to go you know, San Diego to Maine and Tallahassee up to Seattle. We don't want to go that wide. So we're going to focus on getting into a couple key retailers that we can really partner with and invest in and then expanding through those local markets. So in LA, we're working with some, a DSD distributor that helps us get into the bodegas and the convenience stores and the sandwich shops and just building density around key retailers will be the focus from there. I think Steve could talk to kind of the brand and marketing and online business. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, like a big part of our story I talked about, it's like go slow enough where we can learn, go fast enough uh, so we can go, uh, sorry, go fast enough where we're still growing. I think the really interesting opportunity that we have in the ideas of going through food service and these alt channels is they are marketing and it's marketing that you don't really have to spend a, a huge amount of money get in front of these very high quality potential uh, customers, consumers. So I think it's going to be continuing to go on that. But what we really want to start investing in is more of the content side of things. Um, so we're going through candidates right now of a potential social media slash content creator person that would come in-house um, and really awesome. build the presence of the brand and really become like the face of the brand. Um, I know Alex and I have beautiful faces, but 200 plus pound hairy faced men aren't going to be the, the, the face of this brand. Uh, <laughs> So really trying to find uh, the right person who's not only a uh, personality, but like also just like a savvy marketer. Like it needs to be someone who can create content, but also can show up at an event and really speak to the brand uh, well. So it's, it's a very important role for us, um, but also one that we don't need to like jump into bed with someone. Sorry, that's like a probably not very. Yeah, no, it makes total <laughs> sense. It seems like a very important role that you're going to, you know, spend a lot of time and energy figuring out who the right person is. It's a exactly. lot of it's a lot of threading the needle right now. Our expanding off the phrase that Steve was using was the way that I phrase it on the operations and finance side is go slow enough to make the mistakes before they're so big that your bank could potentially bankrupt the business. You it's need to get the, the the flavor in the back end right, but moving fast enough to make the unit economics support a CPG business is is really been a huge focus. We've spent the last six months building manufacturing and supply chain relationships to get our merge in a new and honestly really high position for next year. Um, so that's kind of where we are. We're hitting that first level of scale where the unit economics is starting to work. So our whole focus is how can we get, you know, like a product margin into the 60% range. Love that way that. we've got room for trade spend, enough room for freight to really have a margin that is best in class. 
and will support our growth without having fantastic uh, uh, you know ring rings rings true in my ears hearing uh, anything around margin and and improving those so i think that's awesome for you guys um as we're obviously we're running out of time, I would love to jump to the questions that I was, I'm pumped to ask you guys that I love to ask every f- group of f- founders that come on the podcast. Um, the first one, and I, I'll, you both can answer because I'm sure they could be different, um, is all around getting shit done. So whether it's planning yearly goals, deciding what is the priority for the week, all the way down to like what you're getting done today. Um, would you guys mind jumping in and sharing or, you know, I don't know if you guys are pen and paper kind of guys, do you guys use apps? What are the tools that you surround yourselves with to to hit goals, whether it's personal business and ultimately just to get shit done today? You want to go first? Yeah, I can go first. He's much more organized than I am. I'm kind of a maniac. (laughs) Um, I keep a lot of everything in my brain. Okay. Um, Doesn't help with my sleeping habits, but it's, it's all up there. I think a lot of what I do is I, I will write down sometimes in the notes app on my phone or right before I go to bed, I'll often set reminders that are periodically timed throughout the day where they're kind of spaced out. And I'll write down a couple of the key email follow-ups. Maybe there's some modeling I need to do that I need to get done. I'll put down on notes or in a reminder. Um, honestly, though, a lot of the stuff is stored in my head, which I want to get better at. I do, we do work with our new operations lead who organizes a lot of his freight and supply chain stuff through ClickUp, which okay. yeah. thinks about, we use Notion, not really from a task management standpoint, but really as like a home base for passwords and codes and different documentation. But a lot of it's just Google Drive and kind of tracking that, but I'll let you yeah. see how you organize it. It's honestly pretty similar. We tried doing Notion. Uh, I use Notion on occasion for myself, especially if it's a day where I'm like, okay, I'm going to be traveling all day tomorrow. I need to get these 10 tasks done. Um, I think that's super important and something that I definitely want to get done, especially when we get closer to the summer. Because summer is like, summer is like Super Bowl, right? It's yeah, like, right, right. It's like a hundred day gauntlet of just getting cans into people's hands, doing demos, making sure that products on the shelf at a store that it's supposed to be at, which if you're thinking about getting into CPG and selling into a grocery store, I can guarantee you that you are going to think your product is on a shelf and it is not going to be there uh, multiple times a month at the same retailer. Um, So like that, when we get into those like sprints, like it's definitely super important to have that where we've been in this phase now, like post hundred days of summer through the end of the calendar year, where we've really been trying to get all of our systems in order in terms of like, product margin, supply chain, like getting from a sleeved can to a printed can, uh, all these types of things that have been like very like macro level. This needs to get done before the end of the year or this business might not exist by this time next year. Uh, Got it, yeah, yeah. Last done. But I think in the day-to-day minutia, it really is more like um, in between like whatever we can do to get stuff done. When you have two people, we kind of bug each other on tasks that aren't what we work on to make sure that we don't forget certain things so i'm like did you follow up with that person can you follow up with that person yeah to keep it keep it going you just there's something to be said about having yeah that yin and yang of two co-founders is so crucial right because it's like you can have the perfect system but ultimately like you can i feel like when you have two people you can really feel like the temperature of the business um and you guys i'm sure, sure i can tell as brothers too it's like an extra extra gear you guys probably have just to keep each other in check yeah trying to find that balance of uh of like brothers slash business partners has honestly, we've been pretty good. There's been occasions where we're like, what are we doing here? Uh, so yeah, I'm sure. Right. Uh, we, we definitely, there's definitely some work to be done, but we're, we've been pretty good so far in terms of keeping each other in check and also like, uh, getting shit done. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like anyone can have a good idea, but can you actually start that idea and then continue to execute against it? So, um, I think we also like we have really good advisors that have been in the industry for a while that like keep us in check of like, okay, don't look at that shiny object. There's a lot of other very important things that you need to do before a shiny object is even feasible. Um, so, I mean, but like, for example, the Instacart distribution deal or not, you know, what Instacart yeah. unlocked. Yeah. Like, if Flex didn't start working on a lot of the product margin stuff six, seven months ago, we would not be able to do what we want to be doing with that deal. So, like, 
the macro things we're getting done and the timeline that we set out for ourselves. Um, now that we have those, we're going to have a new set of macro goals that we're going to need to hit and all the micro weekly, daily, monthly goals. Um, that's probably do. It's probably a good reminder. We'll probably do to do some, uh, some goal setting for next year. Love it. Yeah. I was gonna say we're, we're at the perfect time to be doing that. So yeah. love that. Um, the second to last question is just source of knowledge. So for you guys, obviously you're in the weeds of, of CPG, but do either of you have any books, podcasts, articles, anything you've read, listened to lately, watched that you think the audience would uh, take some value from today? I mean, the <laughs> this book has probably been mentioned on your podcast, but Ramping Your Brand, uh, Dr. James Richardson is kind of the the blueprint per se. Uh, so I definitely recommend Ramping Your Brand. He gives a really interesting perspective on building a brand and really thinking about outcomes and what consumers are really consuming when they buy food or beverage, especially better for you product. In terms of me, I'm kind of a podcast junkie, especially in the early days, I was driving a lot to demos, meetings, whatever it was. So I, I've listened to so many podcasts are almost isn't another podcast episode for me to listen unless someone's dropping a new one. Uh, but Taste Radio is one of the big ones early on, kind of like just hearing founders talk. Um, but I've listened to every CPG podcast there is. But really, the best source of knowledge is going out and failing at something and then asking someone, like asking why a lot and trying to understand the systems. I think the only way to learn this industry is to be annoyingly obsessed with figuring it out. I, I'm so curious to know like how this works that I'm always asking questions like texting one of our main advisors all day long. Like what does trade spend look like when you're doing a multi-pack versus a single offering in a fridge? Those are just things you can't Google. Yeah, you love can't. that. So just like thinking through all that, I think- You're not gonna ask that unless you actually are really, really nerding out on trade spend. Right. I mean, like that, that is a great question. That's a good example. But it's so important. I think the reason a lot of brands fail is because it is so complicated and it's easy to think, oh, well, we won't do multi-packs until year five in Kroger. But if you don't set up your price pricing to support that margin and trade spend down the line on a different offering, then you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. So you kind of have to learn it now mm -hmm. or yeah. else you're going to screw yourself over down the line. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I know I've talked about it on here before. That was one of the biggest things I learned at our X bar was, um, you know, th those er the early folks at our, our X bar did, uh, even now, after talking to a lot of brands, um, they were probably one of the best that I ever met as far as like they planted those flags on price points so early and stuck to them and said no to Walmart multiple times, said no to some of the big guys until they got the price they needed to have. And it was everything. So I, that's that's great advice for people listening, for sure. Yeah. I'd say Dr. James Richardson as well. Uh, Alex has, Alex really pushed me to read that the first time. I okay. Like, well, if you both are it. recommending it, I got to add this yeah. to this. I've not read that. It's, uh, it's like, it's quote unquote, the Bible for a lot of people. Um, okay. I think Twitter is an interesting resource to at least pique your interest into topics, but there's a lot of BS there. Um again definitely think talking to people but i think it's super interesting like the we started our journey on google but half the shit that we're learning you can't learn from google it's failing um i think the the pricing thing is really interesting too because like you meet like we meet people that are about to launch and we're like i had a i had a friend buy us at a store when we were on sale and they're like are you not doing well like at the store i was like no we're we're actually doing quite well at that specific location in that chain and they're like well then why are you on sale and it's like that's marketing in this space <laughs> the margins are so thin you don't really have a, a lot of other levers to pull for marketing and so i was explaining to that and they they worked at they're a nike person they worked at parachute before parachute oh, okay. famously did not have a sale ever until like last year and so for her she didn't really understand that like new age brand being on sale and so i think there's just like a lot of things that you learn where like we put our product on the shelf. We were on sale. We were on display. And then now at a couple of these locations where we've been able to track data, which is also really hard to come by at retail. Right. Not only did we continue to sell well, we actually sold better off promotion the weeks and months leading after our display and our discount. 
So it's like cool to learn by doing and either failing or succeeding. Um, but then there's also like, uh, here's one where we learn from, from failing. We were told that we were going to launch at Erewhon on, on June 1st, 2022. We didn't okay. end up getting on any of the shelves until like the 10th, but we announced that we were going to be there June 1st. Uh, and then we found out we weren't there from friends and uh, ourselves. So like, Oh, bummer. So you like, like promoted that, it and no one was there. Yeah. Well, like the product wasn't there because yeah. it was probably our fault. Um, and But there's just there's just so many things that you learn and learning by doing is really good. But reading and then piquing interest. I, I'm good friends with Andrea Hernandez from The Snack Shot, but also she's a great resource for like new and upcoming brands. It's more about like what's happening in terms of like the zeitgeist with brands. But, oh, cool. Uh, okay. But business wise, Richardson's great. Twitter, LinkedIn are great for like I kind of a going weird into one things. Too. Like a weird something that people probably don't say is open a financial model and scenario plan. Even if like for me, I didn't have a finance background. But the only way to learn it is to anyone can say you need a forty percent gross margin. But until you see what does a forty percent gross margin actually mean fundamentally for cash flow is the big unlock for understanding cpg financials is what does 40 percent gross margin actually mean for the bottom line of the business and how does increasing that or decreasing that affect your runway and experimenting in a financial model and then actually operating that will help teach an early stage founder that has never done finance how to actually look at the business i love that yeah, I I don't know if I've ever had anyone say that on the podcast before, but like getting into the weeds of finance. I I I obviously am biased because I'm a finance guy by trade and and you know, led revenue management and trade management in my career and then that's a big part of obviously what I I help with within even ecom. Um but it's wild to me how many folks don't really have a really good grasp on that. I, for me again, I'm biased. I, I it's hard for me to imagine a world where I could like feel like I understand where my business is going if I didn't have at least some sort of, you know, rudimentary knowledge of that. So that's, that's a really good piece of feedback for people listening. Like, cause I would imagine for any brand, like that's something you could just spend time on early on. It's going to get more complicated, obviously, as you scale and grow. But if you kind of figure out a model or figure out something early on and build onto it, build onto it, I think it's a little bit more digestible than probably where some brands get to pretty quickly. And then it's like, oh, this is way over my head. I'm not going to figure this out. The easiest way to break it down is if you lose 10 cents of cogs and you sell a million units, you have 100K more marketing spend. <laughs> so right. You, like think of it that way. Like I had that realization early. I'm like, if we can shed cogs, we can invest in trade way more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that put my entire focus on operations on reduced cogs, increased margin so he can actually do his job. Yeah, no, I love that. That's so that's fantastic. Money to do my job. Until yeah, exactly. That, um, some, make some fire over here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm taking everything you can, right? Um, okay, the last the last question and the most important question for everyone listening today that's you know loved this story, loved hearing your guys' story. Where can people find Leisure? We've talked about most of the retail locations, and obviously you're on Amazon. You have your own website. Uh, is it the best place for people to try it and find the product? And then how can people get a hold of you, follow the brand, any of those things that you guys want to plug in. Uh, yeah. This would We're be the pretty time. We're good on LinkedIn as individuals if you, for any reason, would want to reach out to us. Uh, okay. But, I'll, I'll tag both you guys in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, our website is www.leisureproject.co. That's not .com, that's CO. Uh, Leisureproject.com was taken. Um, that's also leisureproject.co is our Instagram and our TikTok Um uh, we're a little bit more active on Instagram. It's uh, as a millennial, I'm a little bit more talented at, at at that space than TikTok. But once we get our our uh, our leader for that side of the business, uh, that'll be popping off soon. Um, but yeah, our, our website you can learn a bit a little bit more. Uh, but if you if you buy on Amazon, Shane gets a little bit more excited about that. <laughs> you can also go to our website and buy with Prime, which is on yes. our Shopify website, which is pretty cool. Um, and if you live in uh, SoCal, NorCal, Austin, Dallas, Chicago, DC, if you go on our Instagram link, there's a an aisle. I want to get one. Oh, free. nice! Yeah, if you get into the store for a discount. Love it. Yeah, I was gonna say aisle's a great spot. Um, obviously, Amazon all the way, baby. We're, we're we're building a rocket ship over there, and then um, 
Yeah, guys. Well, thank you for coming on the show. It was really cool. I mean, I, I obviously learned a ton today. This was eye opening for me and and even gave me we can talk more offline because I can't share this live, but it, it gave me some marketing and advertising ideas, uh, even just talking about like the use case and what you guys heard. So I think we'll have a lot of a lot of takeaways from today's show. And sorry for the technical difficulties that uh, little sorry. little hiccup. We, we, we blazed right through it, though. No one's even going to notice. Perfect. Um, <laughs> awesome. Well, well, I'll add all of that to the show notes. Um, thank you guys again for coming on the show and um, hope everyone enjoyed. Sounds good, man. We'll talk soon.